you have mentioned accumulated quantities. Yes. <laughs> so, does this mean that we are doomed? That we cannot <laughs> save the planet? <laughs> I think we are not doomed. So I'm actually quite optimistic. But we have to understand that it's not enough to simply uh, reduce the rate at which CO2 is emitted. We actually have to think about it as the total quantity that is there. What it means is we can't wait. We have to reduce now as much as possible. It's important to realize that we can't simply imagine the world the way we want it to be. We have to assume that it's going to be the way that it is. It includes most of all the characteristics of human beings, of people. People are not rational. Uh, people have uh, all kinds of opinions and there's different politics that are involved, bureaucracies, conflict between different parts of the world. And I think that's the most important thing we must do. Assume that people are going to be the way that they are. And now the question is, what can we do to get CO2 reduction despite people being the way that they are? Can you give me an example? People are not going to realize that they should make choices now in order to reduce carbon emissions in the future. Instead, they're going to focus on the incentives that they have right now. So what can we do to kind of bring in front of people uh, right now those kinds of understanding. Isn't the main problem that also the politics doesn't, don't realize that we have to act now? I think that that is right. And, and you know, this is what's called present bias, that, uh, you know, human beings always are concerned with what's happening right now, what's happening uh, tomorrow. Uh, even tomorrow seems like a little bit less important than right now, here and now. And then, of course, what's going to happen next year, that becomes even less important, etc. cetera. But um, the laws of physics don't care, okay? And this accumulation of CO2 is effectively saying that we have to address this as soon as we can. But how can we turn this into the positive? So we are looking at ways, for example, of having the display in a car be much more effective at helping you to understand what the impact of your choices are. We have some of that going on now, for instance, when you make a plane reservation, it begins to talk to you about, you know, how much carbon dioxide are you saving? But there may be even more effective ways. Many times, for example, um, when you are doing a financial decision, banks will tell you for your financial decision, what impact will this have so many years from now? That, for instance, in 10 years, if you put money into a savings account, the interest will accumulate and you will earn this much money in the future. That kind of projection saying your uh, saving of carbon dioxide now will have this impact in the future, that might be helpful. Okay, but uh, if I go back to the politics, many times we see that uh, we regular people should uh, make all the decisions to be more ecological. Wouldn't it be uh, more efficient for the planet if the politicians would say uh, the commercial vehicles should become zero emission? So that we should uh, um, find solutions that can be transferred to the zero emission. I think that that is partly true. I think that in addition, we have to kind of respect uh, individual choice and, and not believe that we can tell people what to do. So we, we have a group, for instance, in my lab of behavioral scientists that understand you know, the long history of studying the incentives, the motivations that human beings actually have. Uh, and it turns out that people want to have autonomy, which means not the government telling them what to do, Uh, they want to have mastery. They want to feel that they are able to control their own future. And they want to feel purpose. So I think the key is actually for government policymakers to understand human psychology a little bit better and then to motivate every citizen in their own way to find ways uh, to help the environment. I don't think it's by uh, ordering people what to do. I think it's by showing people the impact that their choices can have and then trusting that they will make the right choice. I think by giving people this sort of menu of options, a diverse number of options, 
and making sure that each one of them is as good as it can be in terms of CO2 reduction. And then giving people the choice and saying, okay, look, you yourself as an individual can make a choice. Different people will choose different things. Certain people that only take short trips in their car and have a outlet to plug in at home, they will choose battery electric vehicles. And I think that's great. And we should make as many of them as we can and make sure that uh, people have the option to choose that. I think other people will do short trips some of the time, but other times they want to take a long trip and there may not be the infrastructure that they need. And so they will want, for instance, a plug-in hybrid vehicle as a option. And we're seeing increased demand for those kinds of vehicles. Even people that want hybrid vehicles, uh, there are cases there. Our job as a manufacturer is to reduce the CO2 output of HEVs also. So for the customers that want that vehicle, that will work too. Here's what I'm trying to avoid. There's a paradoxical effect that can happen if you restrict choice too much. If we say that we only are going to sell certain types of vehicles, then customers who don't want that type of vehicle will make a really bad choice. And that choice is to keep the old vehicle that they have and not replace it with one that puts out much less CO2. And we don't want that to happen because that's the worst result. Uh, another way that we say this is that a vehicle that has zero carbon emissions that is sitting on the dealer lot instead of being used by the customer saves no carbon dioxide emissions. And so what we need to do is make vehicles that customers want, give them the choice, but make sure that each one of those possibilities reduces CO2 as much as possible. The cost here is the main problem because we cannot afford new cars. How can we uh, solve this so problem? It's, a, it's an extremely important point. Um, some customers just can't afford to replace their vehicles that often. And so we know that there's going to be a lot of older vehicles that are on the road a long time. And this is the reason that we're working so hard right now to find ways of making drop-in, low-carbon uh, replacements for gasoline, as an example. And so uh, whether it's an e-fuel or a biofuel, there's a few different pathways there too, but I think this is going to become increasingly important. Just to be clear, it's not a substitute for getting a new vehicle with a new type of uh, energy source. We should do that as much as we can, but it's a realism. It's realizing that a lot of older cars will be around, not necessarily in Northern Europe, for instance, that is a different part of the world, but in many other parts of the world for quite some time. Is this realism present in, for example, in Brussels, in European? <laughs> I am not a politician and I am very hesitant to be critical of any uh, policymaker anywhere in the world. But I think that, you know, these are kind of facts, right? And um, I think that the world is changing to realize that we have to reduce CO2. That's the goal. I was here inspired when you said that efficiency is not the key. Yes. <laughs> What yes. do you mean? Well, so it's very easy once there's any kind of quantitative metric for people to fixate on that metric and say, okay, let's make that as good as possible. But what professional engineers do is they deal in trade-offs. We actually have a set of metrics that we use. Uh, cost is one of them, energy efficiency is one of them, durability is another one. It, it goes on and on and on. And you have to look at all of the trade-offs between the different parts and figure out what do you want to optimize the most. And again, our key goal is as little CO2 as possible, as soon as possible, to reduce that accumulated amount that will be in the atmosphere. When you do that, you realize that it's actually fixating on efficiency is not the right answer. Photosynthesis is a wonderful counter example. Nature doesn't care in terms of what works and what doesn't work and how the trade-offs are made. The evolution of plants on Earth was such that For whatever reason, it decided that efficiency, energy efficiency, did not matter so much. What does it actually matter so much? The propagation, right? To have as many plants cover and adapt to as many environments as possible. And because the sun is so plentiful, and because the area of the earth is so large, it turned out that energy efficiency really wasn't the key thing to optimize, but rather the um, kind of a success of the plant in trying to take over uh, new, new areas. And the same kind of realization that there are multiple performance metrics and you have to consciously decide how much to weigh each of them 
That's true in um, created systems like vehicles, for instance. Uh, you have mentioned several good examples. Can you walk me? Oh, sure. One of the great questions is if we are going to be kind of stuck with um, older vehicles for quite some time, how do we create fuels that will lower their CO2 output? So uh, one example, for example, is uh, trying to use renewable power to make e-fuels. And so where is that renewable power going to come from? Uh, one is solar, one is wind. Uh, another one is a new kind of nuclear reactor, uh, which is called small modular reactors. There's many uh, startup companies in the world that are working on this, and I'm very optimistic about what that will be like. Uh, the final one, um, and I'm sure there's even more, is uh, what's called enhanced geothermal. Uh, standard geothermal power, there's great examples in Iceland, uh, but that's very specific to that geography, that place in the world. Enhanced geothermal uh, is possibly available in many other parts of the world. It uses drilling technology from oil and gas industry uh, to actually access the hot rock that is, um, that is under the ground. It's, it's not the kind of low temperature geothermal that can be used for heat pumps for houses, for instance. Uh, the temperature here is much higher, and so you drill down further down into the uh, earth, uh, but then you use fracking, and that has always been thought of as a bad thing. In this case, the fracking is being used to create the pores inside the rock, so you can pour water down there and then turn it into steam, and then the uh, steam or the very hot water comes up, and then you run a enhanced geothermal cycle off of that. But this is just you know one of several other methods that are out there. I, I think that there's going to be plenty of renewable power in the near future, uh, and the question is, how do we get that energy, that renewable energy, to where it needs to be used? And liquid fuels are actually very, very good at transporting energy and storing uh, uh, energy over the long term. Also cost-wise? Presently. But I think in the future, if the feedstock uh, cost goes down, that uh, the cost of low-carbon liquid fuels will also go, go down to be competitive. Great. Thank you very much for sure. this. Sure, very, very good uh, to chat with you. Thank you.